With that, I want to introduce Erin uh, Gibson, who has uh, got her PhD in psychology at Berkeley, came over here in, uh, about six or seven years ago, and has been doing uh, postdoctoral and, and uh, RA work um, in neurology and is now joining the faculty. We'll be opening her lab soon. Erin uh, Gibson. Thank you all for having me here today to talk to you about triglial dysregulation following early life chemotherapy exposure. Um, so first off, I'm going to acknowledge that most of this work was done in the lab of Michelle Manje, who's a fabulous mentor and scientist and doctor here at Stanford. Wonderful graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, um, our amazing collaborators, and obviously our funding sources, including MCHRI. So I am really interested in how the brain develops, brain maturation. And this is because you can see it right in front of your eyes when a baby's born. When it's born, it's kind of a blob. Can't do much, can't control its eyes even very well. And in a very short period of time, it's capable enough to ice skate on its own. I also like showing pictures of my children. So this is them ice skating. Um, but the part of, matura of brain maturation that I'm really interested in is myelination. And what this is, is this is a process in which this mature glial cell, it's called a oligodendrocyte, ensheaths or wraps myelin around axons to allow for fast saltatory neural transduction. This allows neurons to transmit their messages in an efficient manner. And these cells, these mature oligodendrocytes that create this myelination, arise from this proliferative population called the oligodendrocyte precursor cell, or OPC. And this is the most robustly cycling cell in the human brain. Myelination is also fascinating because different types of myelination happen throughout brain development. A lot of times what we think of as myelination is truly just we coin as developmental myelination. This is the laying down of sort of bulk myelin early in development, starting in the third trimester through the first three year, few years of life that allows you to become that little blob of a squishy baby into that ice skating five-year-old. But myelination actually occurs in a very protracted manner. So there's another type of myelination, which we've coined adaptive myelination. This is neuronal activity-induced myelination. It allows neuronal activity and experiences in the environment to influence how circuits are myelinated to allow them to sort of function optimally. But it's a very protracted process. And what's really interesting is that the cells that give rise to myelin these OPCs are so proliferative. And so we were curious about how agents that target highly proliferative populations, specifically chemotherapeutic agents, could affect these OPC populations and subsequent myelination. And this is especially important because childhood cancer survivor rates have dramatically increased over the past 50 years with about a 70% decrease in mortality. There's actually projected to be about 20 million survivors of cancer in the US alone by 2026, and that's truly remarkable. But what that leaves us with, unfortunately, is the high, a high percent, the majority of these individuals suffer a neurological syndrome which we call chemotherapy-related cognitive impairment or colloquially chemobrain. And so the majority of these survivors suffer from difficulty in concentration or attentional deficits, difficulty in thinking or speed of information processing, difficulty with recall, memory, multitasking. They tend to have motor deficits, higher rates of anxiety and depression. And so we were curious what this OPC look, population looked like in the brains of individuals who are exposed to chemotherapy early in life or age match controls. So in collaboration with Hannes Vogel here in neuropathology, we acquired frontal lobe sections of individuals who were exposed to chemotherapy early in life or, or those who were not. And what we found was a significant depletion of this OPC population, but it was selective to white matter tracts where this myelination is most robust, not in the gray matter areas. And so we wanted to look at this further, so we created a mouse model of a juvenile chemotherapy exposure using the antifolate chemotherapeutic agent methotrexate, which is quite commonly used um, in both pediatric and adult cancers. And so using a pharmacological dosage that was equivalent to what we see um, in clinical uh, treatments, we injected mice with either 100 mg per kg of methotrexate, MTX, or a vehicle control, PBS, at postnatal day 21, 28, and 35. And then we looked at these animals one month or six months after treatment. 
And what we found in these mice was very similar to what we'd seen in the human populations. We see a persistent decrease in the OPC population as well as the mature oligodendrocyte population. And this persisted for up to six months but was specific to the white matter tracts. Consequently, we see changes in myelin architecture. So we see a much thinner myelin sheath around these axons, causing a dysmyelination phenotype. When you looked behaviorally at these mice, we saw neurological disorders that were similar to what we see in the human population. Specifically, we tested for short-term memory and attention, and animals that were exposed to chemotherapy early in life could not discriminate between a novel and a familiar object, which a normal animal can do quite easily. And this persisted for six months. So this persistence of this phenotype was what really caught us because methotrexate is cleared within 24 hours. So why do we see such long-term effects? So we turn to another glial population in the brain. These are microglia. Microglia are the resident immune cells of the central nervous system. And what we found was that methotrexate directly activated these, these microglia, and they stayed activated. They, we sort of turned them on, and they never shut back off. And consequent to this, those activated microglia then caused astrocytes, another glial population, which is very important for sort of maintaining uh, synaptic structures in the brain, to be reactive. And these astrocytes weren't actually made reactive by the chemotherapeutic agent directly. It was only through this microglial activation. And so we thought that potentially controlling this microglial response, we could then maybe abrogate the phenotype we were seeing and the neurological and myelin deficits we were seeing. So we used a, a microglial depleting factor called Plexicon 5622. It's a colony stimulating factor one receptor inhibitor. And when you administer it to the animals during the month following their last chemotherapy uh, treatment, you get about a 70 to 80 percent reduction in microglia within in the white matter. And interestingly, this microglial depletion was actually able to normalize um, the chemotherapy-induced astrocyte re reactivity we saw. We no longer saw the persistent depletion in OPCs and, um, and mature oligodendrocytes. So you can see the, the yellow bar is more equivalent to the black bar in these graphs. And we no longer saw the thinning of the myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath was of the same thickness as a control animal. And this led to those animals that were previously exposed to methotrexate to now be able to discern between the novel and the familiar object. So they, are, they were no longer uh, neurologically dysfunctioned from their chemotherapy exposure. And so this was really interesting. Um, and at the heart, what we found essentially was that underlying this sort of chemo brain phenotype that we see is this complex triglial interaction, which seems to be centered on microglia being activated. And so where I wanted to take this work was to figure out, is there a way we can control how these microglia are activated to begin with so we don't have to go depleting them by 70 to 80 percent, but that then we don't see the subsequent um, deficits that we see? And so I turned to this approach, this chronotherapeutic approach to cancer treatment. So for those of you unfamiliar, chronotherapy is this idea that pharmacological agents are metabolized differently throughout the day. Especially in cancer treatments, chemotherapeutic agents can be administered at a certain time of day, so they're more effective at targeting cancer cells and actually less toxic to the healthy cells that we know are important, and so you can minimize side effects. But we haven't used chronotherapy to try to abrogate chemo brain yet. And so is there a certain time of day in which we could administer the chemotherapeutic agent that it wouldn't disrupt these glial cells so predominantly? So we used our same paradigm, mouse model of juvenile chemotherapy exposure, but now we gave the injections at either 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. And what we found was that this methotrexate-induced microglial activation was time of day dependent. We only saw it when we administered the agent in the evening. And consequently, we only saw the dysregulation of the OPC population and mature oligodendrocytes when it was administered in the evening, not in the morning. And so what this tells us is that these glial cells, cells may be modulated in a circadian or 24-hour manner. So the molecular circadian clock is a transcriptional translational negative feedback loop that oscillates on approximately 24 hours. And virtually every cell in your body has this machinery. And we know how it works greatly in the brain, in the skin, in neurons in the brain, in the skin, in the liver. But we know very little about its role in glial cells. 
and we know hardly anything about it in OPCs, which is shocking because they're so highly proliferative. We know the genes that are core to this molecular clock are found throughout the lineage. And so we genetically knocked down this molecular circadian clock using an OPC OPC-specific NG2 Cree mouse crossed to a circadian-specific BMAL1 Phlox mouse to make these cells arrhythmic, and then we looked at what we did to the OPC lineage. And what we found was that circadian dysregulation of OPCs decreased OPC density and mature oligo density throughout the brain by about 40% when we looked at postnatal day 21. And then we subsequently saw a decrease in myelin proteins that were essential to form forming compact myelin, and, and, and specifically here is myelin basic protein. And when we looked behaviorally at these animals, what we found was that they had motor dysfunction, extreme motor dysfunctions. And these are knockouts that have had the knockout of the circadian clock in OPCs from embryonic development. So we did a more subtle version in which we induced the knockout in OPCs after the developmental wave of myelination. So we induced it around P20, but these animals still show the same sort of deficits. They still show these extreme motor deficits and white matter uh, deficits. And so this work is very exciting. It's ongoing. Um, as Mark was saying, it's going to be the launching point for my new lab, which will be starting here in January. So if you're interested or you know anyone who's interested um, in how glial cells modulate neural circuitry, especially with a circadian or sleep twist, send them my way. I promise it'll be fun. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, just a second. So I, I, I think we have time for one question. Um, someone that wants to ask a question, there's microphones on both sides. Hi. Up, you got scoop. Yes. Go, go okay. ahead. Thank yes. you for a great talk. I'm curious to understand how your finding on the white matter translate to imaging or any um, of those. Uh, yeah, so we. We haven't done much um, with imaging yet, but there's a lot of studies showing that, why, uh, that DTI can pick up changes um, in myelination really well. We haven't currently done any, um, but that's on the doc, docket to looking at it. But it's a lot of the changes we see are really microstructural changes, which might not get picked up. Um, with the current imaging. Yeah, so, that's why yeah. The, your work is so interesting because yeah. usually we see very general changes that we cannot nail down. So exactly, yeah. Things. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a thing that's currently sort of we're trying to work with. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have room for one quick question as well? A second? No. Yeah, as you, as you are well aware, I'm sure that the uh, microglia in the brain are a uh, persistent population of yolk sac derived cells. And I wonder if that, and, and they're privileged and they persist. Yeah. And I wonder if that might have an, uh, something contributing to the explanation of why you don't have chemo liver or chemo heart where, they don't, where these cells don't persist from the yolk sac. Yeah, I think that's a piece of the puzzle for sure. Um, I think the other issue with, with microglia is we don't know much about why they, we can deplete them and they can come back and, and the dynamic nature they have naturally in the brain. Um, the problem with chemo in other respects is that we, you know, chemotherapeutic agents can very differently affect other organs at, when it's administered at a different time of day. So we see extreme differences in our um, GI tracts of our animals when we give it at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So there's a whole other aspect there that we're curious about. <laughs>